These are Ibrahim, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup, all the way from Michigan, USA. You are a vertebrate paleontologist and National Geographic Explorer based at the University of Detroit Mercy, and you're known for your expeditions to the Sahara, where, amongst other fossil finds, you've uncovered skeletal remains of the famed dinosaur, Spinosaurus. Now, uh, how have you been doing since the uh, current pandemic situation. Now, I've interviewed a few scientists since the coronavirus lockdown, and I'm sure, like them, you're getting on with your research, but you probably miss getting out in the field as well, I'm assuming. Yes, yeah, certainly. Thanks for having me. Um, no it's, been a, it's been a strange situation, and uh, for me, as, as a paleontologist, I always look at these um, situations in kind of like in the big picture. And it's really surprising how quickly um, many aspects of our daily life have, have um, collapsed. I think we sometimes believe that we are in absolute control of planet Earth, right? I think many people really do believe that. But the truth is that we are at the mercy of viruses, uh, volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, <laughs> you name it. Um, and so these events also serve as little reminders that we're not quite as powerful as we sometimes like to think. Um, and of course, paleontologists know that, you know, Homo sapiens um, is going to go extinct at some point. Uh, uh, you know, it's going to happen one day. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at the bigger picture, um, we can try to make the most of our time on this planet. We can try to make smart decisions. We can try to uh, make it last as long as we can, um, our presence on this planet, um, try to find ways to um, use resources in, in uh, responsible ways, or we can continue on our current path um, by decimating biodiversity, uh, by destroying essential protective systems like rainforests, um, we can continue to uh, treat animals and ecosystems in appalling ways, uh, which in, in some ways uh, also makes the appearance of new viruses more, more likely, by the way, um, and essentially seal our fate and, and, and walk into a, a major extinction event of our own making. Well, before we hear about your expeditions and sink our teeth into the world of Spinosaurus, let's just hear a bit about your background. Now, you fell in love with dinosaurs at a very young age, and that was while growing up in Germany, isn't that right? Yes. So um, I grew up in uh, Berlin, Germany, um, mm -hmm. which was a great place to grow up in um, for a kid interested in um, uh, natural history and animals. Um, I always had a passion for animals, their anatomy and, and their evolution. I also had a, a deep-seated uh, desire to travel to far-flung corners of the world. I spent a lot of time uh, reading books uh, about, uh, you know, the people climbing, uh, you know, Mount Everest or exploring the Amazon. And mm. so um, Paleontology allowed me to kind of combine these these different um, interests and, and, and passions. Uh, my love affair with with paleontology, in particular, started with a book, and um, it was a book on prehistoric life. And when I read that book, I was hooked. It was just you know these incredible dragons from deep time. Um, and it was the first time I really understood that, you know, the world we live in today is just a tiny little slice of time in a much bigger story, the greatest story out there, the history of life on Earth. And when I realized that you can actually go out there to far-flung corners of the world and excavate creatures to mm. fill 
gaps in this incredible story and, and, and help flesh out this story, um, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And, and I decided there and then that I wanted to be a paleontologist. Now, many kids have an interest in natural history um, and they kind of lose it when they grow up. And I was fortunate enough to live in a place like Berlin, um, which has a very vibrant cultural landscape. So, um, you know, I, I got to visit uh, zoos, there are actually two zoos in Berlin and, and many different kinds of museums, including a, a world-class natural history museum, which features the, the world's tallest mounted dinosaur skeleton. So the um, museum. It's, uh, yes, the Naturkunde Museum in, in Berlin. And um, they have this amazing hall of dinosaurs. And um, so it was a place that really, you know, nourished my, my, my interest in, in natural history. Um, and so that's where it all uh, began um, in, uh, you know, West Berlin, uh, as it was called before the wall came down. Um, that's where it all started for me. And, um, and at around that time, when I was five or six years old, I started to um, get a better understanding of, um, you know, a current state of knowledge of you know, paleontology. And I came across all the uh, charismatic dinosaurs from North America, T-Rex, Triceratops, Stegosaurus. But I also uh, learned about some mysterious creatures like Spinosaurus, um, dinosaurs that were only poorly understood. And as a scientist, um, that's really where you gravitate, at least that's what, what I did. You want to find out more about these mysterious, poorly understood creatures. Uh, and that's what really drew me uh, to Africa. Now, over the last decade, you've led several expeditions to the Sahara Desert of Africa looking for dinosaur fossils. Your first trip out was when you were in your mid-20s. So what was that like for you? And did you find anything interesting on that occasion? So, yeah, so I, um, I led my first expedition to the Sahara Desert in 2007 and 2008. And it was a, a really daunting challenge. You know, I always wanted to lead an expedition to the Sahara. But um, I realized that this is not going to be easy. You know, and some people, mm. including academics, told me um, that, you know, it was maybe not a good idea. Uh, that, like... You know, it's very difficult to find good fossils in this part of the Sahara and you're probably going to return empty-handed. Mm. And, uh, you know, you also feel a big responsibility on your shoulders. You know, you're going to bring a group of, of people out there. You want to return alive. And you also yeah. want to find some interesting fossils. And, um, you know, it was um, a real adventure. But I knew that I was prepared. And I was fully convinced that we were going to find interesting things hmm. and uh, and we did it was not easy uh, we had to face all kinds of challenges it's a really difficult place to work in but um, we found incredible fossils we collected um, many hundreds of, of different fossils including some really spectacular ones um, one of them is actually the largest dinosaur bone ever found in this part of the Sahara um, so we certainly did not come back empty-handed um, but, uh, you know, it was a, an opportunity for me to learn that sometimes you just have to trust your um, inner feelings and your guts to a certain extent. Um, because, you know, there's no training course, you know, there's no Sahara Expeditions 101, you know, you have to go out there and do it. And uh, it worked out really well and the rest is history. I suppose nothing uh, prepares you for a scorpion getting in your tent at night, I would assume. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the things we experience out there um, make, you know, Hollywood movies look really boring because really? it, it's crazy <laughs> what, what happens when you're out there. And yes, yeah, so there are scorpions, there are snakes, there are sandstorms. Um, and I sometimes tell people, you know, when they ask me, well, this is, this is like a Hollywood movie. I tell them, well, except that we don't have stuntmen. <laughs> the snakes are real. They're not rubber snakes. <laughs> yeah. And um, there's no CGI. Those are real scorpions. <laughs> and oh, so, you know, it's, it really makes you feel alive being out there experiencing those things. 
So it's a, it's a really interesting part of being a paleontologist, and it allowed me to combine my my passion for for, for animals and, and, and animal biology with um, uh, you know my desire to travel to far flung uh, places in the world, like the Sahara. All right, so we're looking for remains of an enigmatic giant predatory dinosaur called Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus is a really strange animal. It has long narrow jaws like a crocodile and a giant sail on its back. And it was a water loving dinosaur, a dinosaur at home in a huge river system. So what you see here is the Sahara, uh, one of the driest places on earth. But a hundred million years ago, this was a huge river system. And Spinosaurus was a river monster. It fed on giant fish, some of them longer than a car. And it was the king of this ancient lost world. Well, it was in 2013 that you finally tracked down a Spinosaurus dig site. Now, before we hear about what you found there, can you talk about this creature, when it lived, why it's so special, and also why its bones have been so elusive? Well, um, the very first Spinosaurus skeleton was unearthed in a different part of the Sahara in, uh, in Egypt, in a place called the Bahariya Oasis. Hmm. And these bones were described by pioneering uh, German paleontologist uh, Ernst Stromer. And uh, he did not find a complete skeleton, uh, but he found enough of the skeleton of Spinosaurus um, to uh, deduce that this was a really bizarre creature. Um, he had a strange, slender lower jaw with conical teeth, a little bit like um, the, the teeth of a crocodile. Mm. And he had big, tall spines uh, that uh, formed a magnificent sail on the back of this dinosaur. Um, and he also realized that this was a very large animal, maybe even larger than T-Rex. Um, so really spectacular discovery. Uh, the bones were shipped to the Bavarian State Collection uh, Museum in Germany, mm -hmm. where Ernst Stroma was, was uh, working and, and, and uh, looking after the fossil collection. And um, he was also a professor uh, at the University of Munich. Um, so everything was going very well for Stroma. He had uncovered this, this strange lost world of Saharan dinosaurs. Um, he lived in a beautiful castle uh, in, mm -hmm. in Germany. Um, he was a successful scientist, um, but then things took a dramatic turn um, when World War II erupted, okay. and uh, um, Stroma's life was turned upside down. Uh, he was an outspoken critic of the Nazi dictatorship, uh, but he suffered um, a lot. Um, two of his sons died in the war. Um, the third one only returned after a long uh, time of imprisonment um, in in the hands of the, the uh, uh, Russians, and um, and uh, Stroma's collection, or at least ninety nine point nine percent of the collection, was destroyed in an Allied uh, air raid over Munich. So the entire museum was destroyed, and so the only skeleton of Spinosaurus we had, um, as well as some uh, bits and pieces, he referred to. Uh, a creature like Spinosaurus, and it turns out there were also Spinosaurus bones. Um, this was all destroyed. And so his entire uh, professional life was, was reduced to, to rubble, to dust. It's a very dramatic background story. And so people have been trying to find a new yeah. Spinosaurus um, ever since, uh, but it proved elusive. And so that's one of the reasons why Spinosaurus is such a special dinosaur. So we're looking for remains of this dinosaur here in Morocco in a place called the Kemkem. -Kem. Uh, the Kemkem -Kem is a steep escarpment that stretches along the Moroccan-Algerian border. And we found a Spinosaurus dig site here. And that's really important because the only other Spinosaurus skeleton known to science was destroyed in World War II. So this is a very special place. And what you see here is um, our dig site. You can see that we removed a huge amount of rock um, to get to the bone-bearing layer. Isar, let's just spend a little bit of time on what things were like back in the era of Spinosaurus. Uh, if we were to travel back in time to the Chem Chem Beds area, 
what would the landscape look like and what sort of creatures would we see? It would have looked very different from the Sahara today. The Sahara today, of course, is one of the driest, most inhospitable places in the world. Um, but 100 million years ago, uh, the Sahara was home to uh, a vast river system. And uh, this river system stretched um, all across North Africa. It was home to um, many different kinds of giant creatures, not just dinosaurs. Um, you would have seen um, crocodile-like hunters in all shapes and sizes in this river system, um, giant flying reptiles, pterosaurs, mm. uh, several T-Rex-sized predatory dinosaurs, including Spinosaurus, uh, as well as turtles, lizards, snakes. Um, it was... Um, a very strange ecosystem, even by dinosaur standards, uh, because it was full of um, predators, which is very unusual. Typically, you find lots and lots of plants and dinosaurs. In the same way that you know, if you go to the Maasai Mara or the Serengeti in, in, in Africa today, you'll find huge herds of wildebeest and, and zebra and, and so on, um, and just a few predators, right? Lions, hyenas, and so on. Um, in the Kemkem region of Africa, it was the other way around. Lots and lots of predators and very few plant-eating uh, animals, plant-eating dinosaurs. So really uh, strange. And I've described this as the most dangerous place in the history of planet Earth. So if you were to visit this place as a time traveler, you wouldn't last very long. <laughs> no, I think I will uh, I'll think against it. <laughs> OK, let's look at the discoveries from the Spinosaurus dig site. What was it about the bones from that dig site in southeastern Morocco that shed light on the original set of Spinosaurus bones found in Egypt a hundred years earlier? Well, uh, as I said, the skeleton from Egypt was uh, not complete, and um, Stromer was missing some key parts of the skeleton. Now, what we found um, was uh, another associated skeleton of Spinosaurus, and so some of the bones we found, we could actually match to the ones Stroma described. So we were able to show that this was Spinosaurus. Um, but mm -hmm. we also found some other bones. And we were also able to do things um, that uh, we obviously can't do with the uh, uh, bones that were destroyed in World War II. Uh, we have drawings of those bones, um, the ones that Stroma described. Uh, but we can't you know, handle them and analyze them and study them. Mm. Um, with our bones, we were able to do that. And so we were able to, for example, look at the inside structure of the bones of Spinosaurus. And it turns out that uh, when you look at the inside of, say, the thigh bone, the femur, you see that it's very, very dense. Typically, you have a large opening in the uh, middle of the femur. Um, but in Spinosaurus, it's very, very dense. Um, and dense bone is something you see in animals like manatees, for example, that spend a lot of time in the water. Dense uh, bone is an important... Uh, adaptation for buoyancy control in the water. Um, we also we were also able to to look at the spines of Spinosaurus uh, in a lot of detail. Um, we also found pieces of the skull um, and the hind limbs. Um, so we found out that Spinosaurus had relatively short hind limbs. Hmm. And so our skeleton um, really, you know, helped us reconstruct Spinosaurus, but it also helped us understand Stroma's skeleton. Uh, because there's some overlap, but uh, we also have parts of the skeleton that Stroma didn't have. So um, taking these two discoveries together really allowed us to, to flesh out this dinosaur in um, quite a lot of detail for the first time.
Well, it was just a short time ago that you announced another find, remnants of the Spinosaurus tail, belonging to the same individual uh, we've just spoken about. Now, this is a big deal because we'd never had much of the Spinosaurus tail before, but it wasn't exactly what everyone was expecting, was it? No, it was a big surprise. Uh, when we returned to the dig site, we were hoping to find a few more bones of the skeleton, um, but we ended up finding what is probably the most important part of the skeleton. We found a nearly um, complete tail spinosaurus. We have about 80% of the tail. And it turns out that the, the, the tail of spinosaurus is actually unique. Yeah, 52 centimeters, almost 53 actually. And the centrum we said was? Eight and a half. Yeah, about eight and a half. Long. Yeah, long. Yeah, and tall about seven. Allora, lungo otto e alto sette, giusto? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, about 52. It was absolutely insane. It is a strange paddle-like structure that would have propelled the animal through water. So what we see in the tail is um, long spines that sit on top of the vertebrae. And these long spines extend all the way down the tail, which is something we don't see in other predatory dinosaurs. Um, and there are bones uh, underneath the, the tail bones. These are known as chevrons. Um, and these bones, again, uh, typically in other dinosaurs, get shorter and shorter and shorter pretty rapidly as you go further down the tail. In our spinosaurs, they stay pretty long. So above the tail bones and beneath the tail bones, we have structures that really increase the area of the tail and create this strange fin-like structure. And so when we looked at that um, mm. and the many other adaptations in the skeleton that tell us that spinosaurus spend a lot of time in the water, we realized that we had the first evidence for a uh, propulsive structure in a dinosaur that would have moved the animal through the water. So that was really exciting. And, and, and all of a sudden, this bizarre creature makes sense. You know, the relatively short hind limbs makes a lot of sense. If you spend mm. pretty much all of your time in the water, um, the narrow crocodile-like jaws and conical teeth, which are great to catch slippery prey, um, also make a lot of sense because that's basically what you're feeding on most of yeah. the time big fish and this river system was home to really enormous fish some of them the size of a car or bigger um, and so all of a sudden everything made sense and we found this crucial piece the, the, the part of the skeleton or the part of the animal because of course there's also tendons and muscles involved um, they would have propelled this animal through the water so um, this is important uh, for our understanding of spinosaurus but it is also a game changer um, in uh, the bigger picture of dinosaur evolution. Because for a long time, uh, scientists suspected that dinosaurs never really invaded the aquatic world, right? Um, they stayed mm. on dry land. Some of them took to the air. Birds are dinosaurs. They're direct descendants of predatory dinosaurs. Uh, but this is really the first really convincing evidence um, of a dinosaur invading um, the watery world. And we are obviously we're not going to confuse them with plesiosaurs because people will say, well, they were in the water, but that's a, that is literally a different animal, isn't it? Yes. This is, these, these things would only be very distantly related to, um, to spinosaurus. And, um, there are other groups of marine reptiles, mosasaurs and so on. Um, those are only very, very distantly related to dinosaurs, um, completely different groups of animals. Yeah. So, as far as we know, Spinosaurus is the only aquatic dinosaur. At this point, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that we'll find evidence for other <laughs> uh, largely aquatic dinosaurs. And I think we will. I think people will have to look at their museum collections again and yeah. see if they can find anatomical clues like the ones we described in Spinosaurus in other dinosaurs. Um, so, that's a really interesting question. You know, was this just a one off, you know, evolutionary experiment, um, or was this part of a larger, um, somewhat overlooked uh, invasion of aquatic uh, habits, um, uh, habitats by, by dinosaurs? And um, we already have some circumstantial evidence from close relatives of spinosaurs 
suggesting that they too spend more time in the water than we currently give them credit for. Wow, that is so interesting. All right. Uh, just quickly, as I'm really curious to know this, did interest in Spinosaurus spike overnight after the release of Jurassic Park 3 back in 2001? Um, it certainly did. Um, I think for a long time, Spinosaurus was a bit of a minor character in the world of dinosaurs, at least in the popular um, picture of dinosaurs. So you'd encounter Spinosaurus in, in, in dinosaur books, but it was usually just relegated to a little corner somewhere, and it looked like a T-Rex-like predatory dinosaur with a big sail on its back. Um, and so I think Jurassic Park 3 is when the wider public first really became aware of the existence of this crocodile-snouted, sail-backed predatory dinosaur. And so what happened in, in Jurassic Park 3 is that they were looking to introduce a new predatory dinosaur and it had to be really big essentially it had to be able to kind of you know replace the t-rex in some ways um and very few predatory dinosaurs fit that bill so um and it also had to look really distinctive so that people wouldn't confuse the new predator and the t-rex yes um and spinosaur certainly looks very distinctive with this giant sail and so um of course you know, paleontologists knew very little about the appearance of Spinosaurus at the time, so they just did, I guess, their best to, to, to um, you know, put Spinosaurus on the big screen. Um, they gave it these long, narrow jaws and a sail. Uh, the proportions of the animal are entirely wrong, but, you know, at the time, they really didn't know any better. Um, one thing they did get right is they um, have one scene where the Spinosaurus um, goes after a boat in the river, so that yes. can spend time in the water, um, and so yes, I think people had then had this love-hate relationship with Spinosaurus. Yeah. In the movie, it kills a T-Rex, which um, not entirely sure why why they did that, but um, you know, I guess again it was to kind of show that this animal could replace the T-Rex, um, and uh, yeah, and so at that point in time, people really, um, you know welcomed Spinosaurus in the pantheon of predatory dinosaurs, I guess, um, in the popular imagination. Uh, but of course, this Spinosaurus has very little in common with the real Spinosaurus mm -hmm. that lived 100 million years ago. But that the same thing can be said about other dinosaurs featured in the Jurassic Park yes. movie. Um, one thing I should add is that, um, you know, and I said that about other Jurassic Park movies in the past, um, I think there are a lot of scientific inaccuracies as far as the appearance of the dinosaurs is concerned. Um, but then again, you know, this, this was um, in many ways something to celebrate. I think, you know, these movies really put dinosaurs on the big screen um, and renewed the public's interest. And yeah. many people, you know, go to, to museums because of, uh, you know, Jurassic Park. So I think... It probably uh, created a lot of paleontologists as well. Yes, yes. I think, you know, it's, it's easy to, to pick it apart uh, in terms of scientific inaccuracies, but, you know, it's a Hollywood movie. It's not a, a documentary film. And so I think paleontologists should uh, rather celebrate the fact that um, their field of study generates this level of interest. That's really rare because typically people will go to watch a movie uh, because they want to see a certain actor or actress or because, you know, it's a, a big action movie with lots of explosions or I don't know what. But in this case, people go to see the dinosaurs, you know? And there are not many other areas of research out there that generate this level of interest. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know. It's a good thing. Yeah, I think overall, <laughs> that's what I would say. All things overall. considered. <laughs> Nisa, you're very passionate about science and science education. You're also very passionate about the preservation of fossils for future generations, quite often due to war and other factors, precious artifacts can be lost forever. What can people do to help ensure that these treasures are properly cared for? Well, there are um, a few things we can do today. Uh, one thing we can do is harness the power of modern technology. So 
we have started uh, creating 3D models of some of the bones of Spinosaurus. Um, so you can create digital copies of real fossils and other things, right? So um, you can ensure that there is, uh, you know, kind of a backup set of bones, as it were. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, that's certainly one way to ensure that, um, you know, priceless artifacts and fossils are preserved, um, you know, for future generations. Of course, you have to make sure that the actual fossils are kept in good, secure conditions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's not always very easy, um, you know, even in places like uh, Europe, you know, many famous skeletons, including the skeleton of Spinosaurus, were destroyed in, in World War II. Um, today, of course, other parts of the world are um, very unstable, and uh, Europe is a very safe place. Uh, we've seen in, in Iraq and Syria what can happen when ancient sites are um, pillaged and destroyed. Um, so, so those are very real dangers. I think one important thing um, scientists and the public uh, can do is um, to ensure that people are really aware of the incredible value of this ancient heritage, right? I think, um, yep. you know, uh, not that long ago, the, the National Museum of Brazil uh, burned down. I'm sure you, you, you read about this, this story. It was a, a devastating loss. Um, and yeah. also a lot of fossils. And right after this devastating fire, uh, many politicians and, and other decision makers um, said, you know, we just lost a huge part of our identity and, you know, this is devastating. And, um, but of course, some of these same people, um, you know, were very stingy in the past when it came to, you know, uh, providing proper um, protection from fires um, yeah. and making sure that the museum infrastructure is not crumbling to pieces. Um, so I think, you know, making sure that people realize how valuable these things are is a very important step. And it's also very important in, in places like Morocco, in the developing world, where many people uh, do not really know why they should care about fossils or other ancient artifacts or their ancient history. Um, so I think, um, you know, there's one reason why I'm so interested in the public understanding of science and, and trying to further the, the public understanding of science in different parts of the world. I think people need to know how valuable these things are, how important they are, um, because they're not going to protect things that they don't really care about, right? Um, and, you know, investing in, in, in new museums and collections is very important. So we created a paleontological research collection for Chem Chem fossils um, in Morocco. Mm. And, you know, we're working hard trying to make sure um, that, you know, this, the collections facilities in Morocco are really up to the job, you know, in terms of, you know, temperature control and safety and what have you. And it's challenging, you know, um, but those are all things we can do, you know, digitize collections, raise awareness of the importance of, of this ancient heritage um, and, um, you know, doing more capacity building in the developing world so that people in those parts of the world can, can marvel at their ancient heritage. And what would you say to um, people who want to or feel that they should support, say, museums now during the lockdown when, when they're closed? Perhaps they gave some money when they entered through the main gates and, you know, they, they should perhaps support them, you know, on a, on a monthly basis. Yes. I mean, the vast majority of, of uh, museums, certainly natural history museums, are chronically underfunded, mm. um, which is kind of strange. Some of them are in the top museum attractions in the world. If you think of the American Museum of Natural History, for example, or the National History Museum in London. Um, and yet, you know, um, I just heard, you know, the American Museum um, uh, followed a, a number of people. Many people lost their jobs. Um, so these are difficult times, you know. There's not nearly as much funding from museums as people sometimes believe. And these places are a really are really important components of the cultural landscape of a city. So if you think of, of, of London, for example, you know, I mentioned the National History Museum, what would London be if, uh, you know, it, it didn't have all the incredible museums uh, you can visit there, right? It, it would be um, a very, very different kind of place. And yeah. so now is a very good time to support uh, your museums, and not just the big ones, 
also the smaller local museums, I think they all really need help at this point. And some countries are doing a better job at supporting cultural institutions, museums, you know, um, than others. So, you know, try to find out um, what the situation is like in, in your state or your country. Um, this is certainly a very um, good time to support these institutions. And it doesn't just necessarily mean giving money. You can become a member and you can get all sorts of great things that way. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, there are great membership deals um, offered by many museums around the world. Um, and, you know, when now that people cannot visit these museums, many people uh, suddenly realize um, how important uh, yeah. these places were in their, in their lives. You know, even if they only visit a particular museum once or twice a year, not being able to go there, um, I think, uh, gives people, uh, yeah, I think you, you, it really puts things into perspective, you know, and, um, and I'm sure, you know, not just kids all around the world miss, you know, going to see the dinosaurs. I think, you know, people all around the world um, of all age groups uh, would love to, to, to be able to return to museums. But, you know, if we want to make sure that these museums are still viable uh, for the next, um, uh, you know, few years and, and decades, uh, we need to support them now. Okay, that was a fantastic interview. I really enjoyed it, and I know my viewers are going to love this. Uh, I want especially to thank you for agreeing to come on to the show at this particular time when you must be getting interview requests from, I don't know, all directions. So thanks once again. I will leave links to your website and Twitter in the description below. And hopefully, Nisar, you can come on again one day in the future to talk all things dinosaur. Sure. It will be my pleasure. It was great fun. <laughs>